Everyone thought he was a weak salaryman, but he becomes the strongest adventurer in the world. In a messed up wasteland, Rick gets launched across the damn floor in a fight, and he seriously freaked out that he might bite the dust. Just then, his mentors come out of the smoke, and instead of giving him some damn first aid, they start praising him for getting so much better in the past two years of training. So he should have no problem with the E-rank adventurer exams now. And the praise feels good, but homeboy still needs some damn medical attention. Normally, all the adventurers in this messed up world are young because it takes a toll on your body. But there are still so damn adults who never give up on their dreams. That's why Rick's still trying to take the entrance exam. He walks up to the desk and asks for his exam ticket. But while the receptionist is checking his info, she recognizes Rick and gets all hyped up, saying they used to know each other. At first, Rick doesn't remember her, but then it clicks that he saw her last two years ago. They used to be co-workers, and she was totally shocked when Rick up and quit his job out of nowhere. And she was even more shocked when she heard he quit to become an adventurer. Rick feels a bit embarrassed because folks in their 30s like him ain't exactly the usual applicants for adventurers. Normally, you start at a low rank as a teen and work your way up in a year or two. The receptionist asks what Rick's been up to all this time since she ain't heard from him. So Rick explains that he was stuck up in the mountains the whole damn time, training with his mentors. Just then, the usual drunkard from the guild stumbles up to the desk, trying to flirt with the receptionist. But when she tries to turn him down because she's obviously working, the guy won't take no for an answer, so he starts getting a little rough with her. That's when Rick decides to step in. He pulls the guy aside and gives him a light tap in the gut, knocking him out cold. The receptionist apologizes for the trouble the drunk guy caused. But Rick says it's all good because he used to work as a receptionist too, and you don't get why the guild thinks it's smart to serve booze in there. After Rick gets his exam number, he heads outside and gets greeted by a maid named Renette. She asks if he's done registering and Rick confirms, thanking her for waiting on him. And while he says that, he's totally checking out Renette's massive rack. She calls him out on it, so Rick tries to change the subject and talk about how pumped he is for the exam. Back inside the guild, the other adventurers are straight up flipping out at the handprint left on the drunk dude's armor. And that armor was made of some heavy-ass steel. So whoever did this gotta be seriously ripped. Right then, two dudes walk in and recognize the drunk guy from a mug shot they saw a while back. His name's Dumold, and he's a badass A-rank adventurer wanted for 30 counts of assault. The receptionist knows it was Rick who laid the smack down, but if he really took out an A-rank adventurer, he might be overqualified for this shit. Meanwhile, Rick's getting a physical exam, and they measure his height as 174 centimeters. The docs are surprised he's taking this test at 32 years old. After that, all the test takers are taken to the next room and told to put their hands on a crystal ball to measure their mana. The ball lights up based on how much mana a person's got. So the others touch it, and they get different results, with the highest being a C. But when it's Rick's turn, that damn ball barely lights up at all. So the examiner gives Rick an F on his mana test. The other candidates start clowning on Rick for having such weak-ass mana as he walks away. But as soon as the examiner calls for the next candidate, the ball straight up shatters. The next test is to measure their offensive skills. They gotta wail on a green rod as hard as they can. It's some special slime bag that can take a beating, so they don't gotta worry about breaking it. Rick remembers training on that slime bag once, and his mentor told him he had to be able to wreck a golden slime bag with just his fists. Rick thought that was impossible because a golden slime bag's as hard as a dragon's fang. But his mentor said it was the bare minimum if Rick wanted to be a true adventurer. And since his mentor could crush one with a single punch like it was nothing, Rick got motivated to train until it broke, even if he had to punch it 50,000 times a day. He hated that shit, but back to the present, the candidates are lining up to smash the bag with all their might. And after the first dude kicks it, they call up the second son of the Dire Moot family. Rumor has it his magic is as strong as a C-rank adventurer's, even though he's only 11 years old. As the kid steps up, he straight up unleashes a hellfire spell, and everyone including Rick is damn surprised about what just happened. But Rick's actually surprised because that spell was small as hell. The fireball shoots out and hits the target and even the judges are impressed by the kid's power. And that's when Rick's even more shocked because the fireballs his magic teacher had used to toss at him were way deadlier than what this kid just pulled off. Rick naturally assumes the kid's fireball must have been as strong as his teacher's, but maybe the kid scaled it down so it wouldn't wreck the whole damn building. As the power test continues, it eventually comes around to Rick's turn. But, as he's walking up to the slime bag, the examiner stops him and asks if he's really over 30 years old. Rick answers yeah, so the examiner straight up tells him he's too damn old for this shit. Training doesn't usually amount to much unless you start real early in life. And with his weak-ass mana scores, he should just quit before he embarrasses himself. 
Rick knows people be judging him for being old and he feels like throwing in the towel. But he's put in way too much work to get here, punching slime bags till his knuckles were bleeding, and he never stopped squinting. All that pain's got to count for something. So even if he's at a disadvantage because of his age, he's gonna give it everything he's got. Rick winds up his punch, and when he connects with the bag, it straight up explodes and goes flying through the wall, leaving everyone including Rick dumbfounded because he wasn't expecting the bag to be such a pushover. The kid can't believe what he just saw, and he's pissed off by Rick's success because this was supposed to be his time to shine. But he's willing to lose to Rick for now because his specialty is straight up defensive magic. He's planning on outperforming Rick in the next test. But by the time they start the next test, the kid's left speechless because Rick just tanks a fourth nature spell like it's nothing. The examiner gives Rick props for blocking his attacks, and Rick appreciates it because he's doing his damn best. The instructor thinks Rick ain't giving it his all because he's been using only first order spells to defend himself. So he advises Rick to use higher level defensive magic from now on. But Rick tells him he doesn't know any other spells except first order ones, so he's really doing the best he can. The examiner can't believe Rick's limited to first order spells because his mana control is on point. But Rick assures him there won't be no problems, because from what he's seen so far, his first order spells should be more than enough to handle whatever the examiner throws at him. The examiner takes that shit personal, so he's ready to unleash a fifth order spell on Rick to teach him a lesson. He casts the spell and lets loose a shock cyclone that sends a massive shockwave rippling through the whole damn kingdom. It's so damn loud that even a knight on the other side of town can hear that shit. A few minutes later, Sylvester rolls up to the exam center to see what the hell's going on. They tell them some F-rank adventurers straight up wrecked a slime bag with their bare hands and block a fifth order spell like it was nothing, all while using basic defense magic. Sylvester thinks they're playing some sick joke, but they dead ass serious with what they just said. Right now, Rick's grinding through the written part of the exam and he looks hella confident in his knowledge. Once the test is done, he takes a break with Rianette, and she asks how he did on the written shit. Rick says that without any doubt, you will get 100% on that shit. After all, he spent 14 years as a damn receptionist at the guild, so there's no way he will fail. But he's still unsure if his overall score is gonna cut it to pass the exam. Renette asks if Rick's worried about his practical exam scores, but he thinks he did pretty damn well in all the categories. The only problem is he got a big fat F on his mana exam. So being sure how that gonna affect his chances. Renette tells him not to trip because he trained his ass off for this exam. But before they can catch a breather, that kid from earlier storms up to Rick and starts screaming at him for doing too damn well on the tests. Rick's clueless about what the hell is going on, so he figures Freed must be lost or some shit, and offers to help him out. But Freed is pissed because this was supposed to be his day to show off his mad skills to all the peasants and Rick went and outshined him. So now he's crying like an annoying baby. Rick tries to explain he ain't mean to steal his spotlight, but then Freed's sister shows up. And when she sees her little bro crying, she flips her shit and starts yelling at Rick. Rick asks if she's related to Freed or some shit, and she introduces herself as Angelica the big sister. But Freed wastes no time telling her that this 40-year-old man ruined his day. Rick's offended and says he's only 30, but Angelica and Freed keep calling him a 40-year-old man. Eventually, Angelica throws her glove at Rick, challenging his ass to a duel. Rick dumbass that he is, picks up the glove because he doesn't want to get it dirty or some shit. But little does he know picking up that glove is a declaration that he's ready to throw down. So Angelica happily sets up a spot for them to throw hands. She straight up says she gotta get a kick out of punishing Rick for making her bro cry. But if they gonna do this, they gotta stick to the rules. In the Philheim Kingdom, duels let the winner decide the penalty for the loser. So she sets a penalty stating that the loser gotta be the winner's servant for life. Angelica is supposedly some second-class royal knight. But Rick doesn't know how strong this second-class knight is supposed to be, so Renette gives him the lowdown and explains that a second-class knight would be like B-Rank. Rick starts freaking out because he knows B-Rank adventurers can take down giant monsters solo, but Rena is sweating it and asks Rick to hold back so he don't accidentally snuff her. Rick can't even picture holding back against someone at B-Rank while he's stuck at F-Rank. He's still got no clue about his true strength, so Renette tells him to trust all the training he's been putting in for the past couple of years. All of a sudden, all the messed up training memories come flooding back and Rick ends up puking his guts out. Rick cusses out Rionette for making him relive all that hell. But she reminds him that if he survived all that crap, he shouldn't have a problem dealing with Angelica. After all, he's been training with the strongest party on the whole damn continent. So he better start believing in himself a bit more. Rick realizes she's right, so he gets up ready to face Angelica fearlessly. He still ain't sure how his current strength gonna hold up against a second-class knight, but it's pointless to worry about that now. 
Angelica is cocksure she's way stronger than Rick. She promises to go easy on him so we go and end up six feet under, then she starts powering up her attack. Then she uses blink step to zoom past Rick just to flex her speed. They even call her light speed Angelica. But Rick is surprised and it ain't for the reason she thinks. Angelica says she's gonna finish him off with her next attack so she uses blink step again. But as she's closing in on Rick, he can't believe his eyes because Angelica moving like a sloth. The power scales must have been high on helium if they thought she deserved the light speed title, because she is moving slower than Rick's regular running pace. Rick easily dodges her strike, and Angelica can't wrap her head around it because it's supposed to be impossible for an F-rank adventurer to keep up with her speed. Only first-class knights ever manage to react to her quickness, so she tries to make sense of it by saying Rick got lucky, but she won't let it happen again. She pulls off another blink step, but to Rick, it's like she's moving in slow motion. He's starting to question how the hell she made it to B-rank with such sluggish moves. He's realizing that maybe he's actually pretty damn strong. Just as he's about to dodge Angelica's attack, she trips on a damn rock and accidentally pulls off some vertical peel blade move. Rick can't predict any of her strikes, so he's struggling to dodge them. And by the time Angelica finally stops herself, he's losing faith in his own strength because he was caught off guard by that attack. But Angelica was caught off guard too because she didn't plan none of that. She tries acting all cool and tells Rick she's impressed that he dodged her last move because she totally meant to do it like that. But that just means she gotta step up her game and go even faster to overpower him. She busts out her special technique that lets her move three times faster than normal. But even with that speed boost, she's still slow as molasses to Rick. But he ain't attacking recklessly because he don't know what kind of tricks she got hidden. So he keeps dodging and Angelica's mind is blown that Rick can still keep up with her. She can only use that technique two more times before she's out of juice, so she gives it her all and goes for one last desperate attack. But she trips again, so Rick tries to intercept her with a punch and ends up blowing a freaking hole in the ground. Angelica realizes she would have been toast if that punch landed, so she's terrified of Rick and wonders who the hell he really is. Rick just says he used to be a receptionist, but now he's an adventurer. He's pumped to keep fighting Angelica, so he climbs out of the hole to face her again. But Angelica straight up surrenders because she doesn't want to get killed. Rick don't get why she's giving up, but her surrender means he's the winner. And because of the penalty Angelica set, she gotta serve him for the rest of her life. Angelica completely forgot about that penalty, so she does the only thing that pops into her head and runs away. Rick don't really give a damn about the bet, so he ain't bothering to chase after her. And the exam results are about to come out, so gotta go back and see if he passed. That's when Renette drops the bomb that the rest of his mentors are coming to check on him. And Rick's freaking out because their arrival always spells trouble. The next morning, he rolls into the main exam hall where all the participants are sitting their asses down. This attendant girl comes up and tells them they better have their admit cards on deck because the judge is gonna send some mana their way. They go one by one, and if the card glows red, that means they straight up failed and gotta give it another shot next year. But if that shit turns blue, it means they pass that damn exam. Rick's shaking in his boots not knowing what the hell's gonna go down. He looks over at Rianette hoping she can give him some reassurance. She keeps it cool and tells him not to trip, and to have faith in himself. He'd been training his ass too damn hard for the past two years, and she personally thinks he's got what it takes to pass. That eases Rick's mind a bit, and he starts thinking about how pretty Rianette looks, but at the same time realizes that he must be much older than she is. Rianette turns to him and says he ain't gotta worry. Even if he fails, he can always give it another shot next year. But they're gonna have to crank up his training intensity by three freaking times. That shit shocks him because he barely survived their regular training. But before he can say anything, his card starts glowing, flashing red and blue like crazy, building up that suspense. Finally, it reveals the color to be blue, meaning he freaking passed the exam. He bounces out of the hall with a big-ass smile on his face, rolling alongside Rianette. Then out of nowhere, he catches a whiff of this strong-ass scent and covers his nose. That stench is coming from some flashy dude who strolls up to Rianette and grabs her arm. He introduces himself as Raster, the Duke of the Northern Kingdom. Raster doesn't even give a damn about Rick and starts spitting game at Rionette, telling her she's so damn beautiful he wants her as his second wife. Thank God, Rick steps in once again, pissing Raster off. This dude gives him a dark-ass look and asks what the hell an ugly old man wants. Rick tells him straight up that Rionette is his girl, and he can't let nobody hit on her. But Raster starts laughing and acts like he can't believe a middle-aged dude like Rick scored a babe like her. He peeps the adventurer exam card in Rick's hand and starts smirking, saying he can't believe someone at Rick's age is only an F-rank adventurer. But Rick fires back, saying Raster doesn't seem too strong himself. Raster straight up disses Rick, calling him a straight up scrub for not recognizing his greatness. 
He brags about becoming an E-rank adventurer at the ripe age of 14 and now being an A-rank adventurer, as well as the examiner for the second stage of the damn exam. He turns to Rinette and straight up asks her to go on a dinner date with him. But Rinette clings to Rick's arm like her life depends on it and tells Raster to bounce because his cologne is too damn overpowering for her taste. Pissed off, Raster turns around and swears on his mama's grave that he gonna put Rick in his place when the time comes. The next morning, Rick shows up at the exam center and finds out that the second stage gonna be mock battles. That shit scares the hell out of him. Rinette tells him to hold back, but Rick says he gotta go all out against these strong-ass participants, especially if Raster gonna be his examiner. Suddenly, this dude calls out to Rick and says he's gonna be his examiner for the day. That kinda eases his nerves a bit, and the guy tells Rick it's hella inspiring to see a guy his age still trying to become an adventurer. The examiner introduces himself as Lynx and says even he decided to become an adventurer when he was 25, which is pretty late in the game. He'd been hustling ever since. He tells Rick his goal is to become an A-rank adventurer, but damn, it took him 20 freaking years just to hit B-rank. So he ain't even sure if A-rank is possible for him. Rick gives him a pep talk, they shake hands, and before the examiner bounces, he wishes Rick good luck. After that, Rick's feeling pretty good while chilling in the waiting room. Suddenly, this person walks in, opens the door, and says Lynx the examiner got suddenly sick, so Raster gonna take his place for now. At first, Rick don't even think twice because he forgot the name, but Rinette reminds him and he starts freaking out. She tells him Raster is the Duke of the Northern Kingdom, which means he gotta be connected to Knight Angelica and that boy freed in some way. And that's some next-level bad news because Rick done humiliated both of them before. The other participants start getting worried too. And they tell him Raster is one ruthless examiner who gets off on torturing the participants who catch his eye. Dude's got the nickname the f rank Crusher because he loves crushing dreams and souls. Rick realizes he did caught more than just Raster's attention. Later, we see Raster in the examining arena straight up obliterating a participant with his damn spells, calling him a low-ranking peasant and calls the next unlucky soul forward. Rick be shaking in his boots at this point, pacing around like a madman because he knows Raster gonna straight up murder him. All he wanna do is run his ass back home, but if he does that, his senior's gonna triple his training, and that's a one-way ticket to his death, so he's stuck in a real tight spot. Rinette sits her ass down on the floor and tells Rick that if he can lose so much confidence just because of some people talking, then he gotta be able to gain confidence when she shows him the truth. She tells him he done put in enough work and training to breeze through this damn exam, no matter who he go up against. At this point, he got nothing to lose and everything to gain. That shit really puts things into perspective for Rick, and he thanks Rinette for helping him calm the hell down. Suddenly, this small dude of the hood comes over and asks if Rick wanna know his future. Rick being the dumbass he is, ends up accepting the offer, especially when the guy says it gonna be free. He plops a crystal ball on the table and tells Rick to take a seat. But all of a sudden, Rionette peeps that there's a spell on the chair. Unfortunately, Rick straight up disappears before she can even do something, and that pisses her the hell off. She unleashes an aerial slash, tearing through the crystal ball and the wall behind the dude, who turns out to be freed. She realizes it was teleportation magic and demands freed to spill about where he sent Rick. And when he refuses, she straight up uses her finger to slash off his damn eyelashes, threatening that next time she gonna go for his eyes. That shit shakes Freed up, and he spills that teleportation is hella complex. Even a genius like him can only teleport someone about 100 meters away, so Rick gotta be nearby. Turns out Rick got teleported behind the exam center near the freaking beach. But before he could even figure out what the hell going on, a crew of all black dressed peeps surround his ass completely. The old butler steps forward and tells Rick they need him to disappear for a bit. They introduce themselves as the elite guards of the Northern Kingdom, so Rick immediately knows it's a damn plan by Raster. The butler says that all the guards are on the same level as B and A rankers, so Rick doesn't stand a chance against them. But then out of nowhere, his seniors show up on a damn cliff, asking what the hell he doing here. Rick gets scared shitless as they drop down from the cliff, so he straight up tells the butler to bounce because their lives are in danger. But one of the bald idiots goes and attacks the orc. And that beast doesn't even flinch because the blade just snaps when it touches his skin. Now the bald idiot tries to throw a punch, but the orc just grabs his fist and crushes it like a tomato. The other seniors ain't even phased by this shit, while the bald dude got no damn clue what to do. To his surprise, the orc cast a healing spell and heals his arm, telling him to practice some more. Then the blonde gangster tells Rick not to worry because he's gonna handle it like the Texans do, and then he whips out a freaking machine gun from God knows where. The guards start attacking him, but you should never bring a knife to a gunfight because he just uses magical bullets to blast them all down and Rick watching all this horror going on. 
Suddenly, one of the guards snatches up this little demon girl named Alice and holds her at knife point, telling the seniors to drop their weapons. Rick's horrified and tells them to let the girl go for their own damn sake, but Alice just thinking these fools playing some game. So the dude ends up smacking her on the head, and that shit pisses her off real bad, so she straight up blasts them all away in an instant. The butler slowly starts realizing who these people are because he recognizes them. Alice is some prodigy, the world's strongest vampire mage, and she is only 10 freaking years old. Mizette is half dwarf, half elf, and he is so damn skilled he can make future tech. And Ash, he an or who masters all kinds of support magic and has mad strength and wisdom. The butler claims these peeps belong to the strongest damn party in the whole world, with only s rank members up in there known as the Fist. So Alice goes on dealing with all the guards, blasting them left and right, while Rick hauls Ash back to the exam hall to meet up with Rinette, who straight up slams Freed into a wall as soon as she lays eyes on Rick. But before they can even talk, the damn door swings open and Lynx stumbles in looking all beat up. He says Raster forced him to step down as the examiner and locked his ass in the room. He tells Rick to get the hell out of the exam hall for his own safety, but Rick is all pissed off and tells Lynx to chill the hell out. And then we see angry ass Rick marching into the arena, while Raster conjuring up a massive column of fire, ready to put an end to Rick's adventure right here. Before Rick can even step foot in the arena, Raster is out there having a blast, bullying some poor dude who's straight up shaking in his boots. He throws a fireball at the poor guy, roasting him in a hot minute. Now there's this adventurer watching from the stands, and he says that this performance is exactly what he expected from an e rank promotion exam. This dude suddenly breaks in and introduces himself as Adolf, a popular adventurer. He starts telling the crowd about the four cores of power. Physical strength, body control, magic reserves, and magic control. These cores determine how strong and skilled an adventurer is, and Adolf was born with this dope ability that lets him visualize the four cores of power for anyone. He uses his ability on the next contestant and finds out the dude's slightly better in physical strength and body control, but he's still weak. Raster takes him out with just one attack, and Adolf knew this would happen. Then he uses his ability on Raster, and his magic reserves are off the charts, and his magic control is on point two. Adolf exclaims that he is indeed an A-ranked hunter, but then suddenly, his eyes start hurting because looking at powerful folks for too long ain't good for his health. So he shifts his focus to the weakling getting carried away on a stretcher. Suddenly, he spots Rick standing in the corner, and at first glance, Adolf thinks this dude looks hella boring. He's low-key entertained by the idea that someone his age is trying to pass this exam, and he's also curious about Rick's stats. So he uses his ability on Rick, and damn, the triangle of Rick's physical strength, body control, and magic control starts growing way beyond the range of the chart. In just one second of watching him, Adolf's rolling on the ground feeling like his eyes are straight up burning. On the flip side, Elisa comes up to Rianette and says she saw her with Rick yesterday. She introduces herself as Rick's former co-worker from when he was grinding at the guild, and Rianette introduces herself as a fellow party member of Rick. They are getting along just fine when suddenly Alice calls Rinette, asking if she can watch the next match with them. Rinette invites Elisa to see Rick's performance with the rest of the crew, and she's all down for it. But as she gets closer and sees the kinda weird-ass crew, she gets scared as hell when she sees an orc in there. Then that pervert Mazette tries to get Rinette to sit next to him, but she straight up refuses, because she knows he's gonna harass her. Dude immediately switches his attention to Elisa instead, and Rinette introduces her as Rick's ex-coworker. Right then, Rick walks into the arena, and the wise orc Ash asks Rianette how their old rookie doing. Rianette is confident as hell that Rick gonna ace the test without breaking a sweat. But Elisa mentions that Raster is known to be a devilishly tough examiner. She tells Ash that Raster is an A-rank adventurer, and he uses overpowering force to bring low them low-ranked adventurers. Ash ain't worried about it, and turns his focus back to the upcoming fight. In the arena, Raster all surprised to see that Rick somehow survived the attack from his elite guards, he starts talking about them being incompetent commoners, but a genius noble like him ain't gonna give his opponent no chance to escape. Rick can feel the terrifying aura coming off Raster, matching his magic reserves, and the examiner can see that Rick barely has any magic left. Out of nowhere, Rick asks Raster about the reason he became an adventurer. Raster says he did it because he got a talent for it, and it gonna look good on his noble resume too. But Raster then says that he is already bored with it and gonna quit this job real soon. Those words piss off Rick, who declares he ain't ever gonna lose to a punk like him. Raster laughs, saying Rick gonna learn his place real soon. He decides to start the test with an ice shot magic spell that zooms right past Rick's ear and smashes into the wall. Rick doesn't even flinch to dodge it, and Raster asks if he is so scared he can't even move. Rick doesn't even respond to his taunts because right before the match, Rinette told him to stay cool and watch his opponent's moves for the first minute. It took all his patience, but Rick decides to believe in Rinette's advice. 
Seeing that Raster ain't throwing down, Raster decides to take charge and blasts a class 3 fire magic at him without chanting. Rick straight up takes that magic head on and Elisa starts stressing about his safety. But damn, Rick comes out of the flames unscathed. And Ash tells the receptionist that a puny ass attack like that ain't gonna harm their old rookie at all. Ash asks if she knows about the four power cores and Elisa says that she knows about them. Ash goes on to say that out of the four cores, magic reserves gotta be trained from a young age because as you get older, it gets tougher to increase them. Ain't many folks who can boost their mana capacity after hitting 20, but Rick started adventuring at 30. Ash explains that's why Rick's got a measly amount of mana. So when he was training him, the first thing he said was to always rely on his body. Ash gave Rick his first mission, which was to hit up a nearby village, but he had to do it with a 100 kilo ankle weight. Rick was freaking out already, but then Ash told him to quickly follow him because the forest they were training in was full of dangerous monsters. Rick booked it as fast as he could with the weights dragging him down and that's how his first training sesh ended with Ash. Back to the present, Raster busts out a class 4 wind spell on Rick, but he tucks that shit out too. Ash proudly declares that he built Rick's strength from the ground up. Mazette was in charge of teaching him magic control and Rionette helped him boost his body control. Ash goes on to say that Rick faced their grueling training with mad effort. And that's why he already got skills on par with S-rank hunters. Elise is straight up shocked by these words, but the proof's right in front of her as Rick endures another class 4 magic spell from Raster. Rionette tells the receptionist that Rick ain't even aware of his true strength, because Ash kept downplaying his achievements and saying even F-rank adventurers could do that shit. Meanwhile, in the arena, Raster unleashes a deadly combo of different elemental magic spells on Rick, all while calling him a third-rate. He smashes him under two massive boulders, thinking he might have gone too far. But damn, Rick comes out of that mess unscathed. Raster's pissed now, so he decides to end this with his fists. He charges his fists with a powerful attack spell and then rushes ahead at Rick with a flash step that his little sister has mastered. But Rick counters Raster's punch with his own and sends him flying back to where he started. Raster ain't got a clue what just went down, but Rick's starting to piece it together. He thinks Raster was born with mad talents, and his magic game is something to flex. But he's lacking in other areas, and Rick thinks it's because he skipped training because of his big ego. So he's damn sure now he won't lose to Raster in any case. On the flip side, Raster decides to unleash his true power and throws a class 3 fire spell at Rick after chanting the whole thing. But damn, Rick blows that spell away with his bare hands, saying he doesn't even need a spell to block weak-ass moves like that. Raster tells him not to get too cocky because his luck saved him once. He tries to zoom ahead at full speed, but he's too slow for Rick who catches up in a damn flash. Raster tries turning his body into steel to block Rick's punch. Even with a heavy-duty defense spell, Raster feels some pain from that hit. He admits Rick's abilities go way beyond E-rank, but he's still damn sure luck played a role in keeping him standing here. Rick asks that he's too scared to admit his own skills, and Raster asks how the hell someone with just a tiny bit of magic juice can get so strong in two years. That question brings up some messed up memories of when he was locked in a dragon's cage until he could kill it, had to sprint through an explosive field and even swam in a paralytic poison lake till he drowned. Meanwhile, Ash is spilling all this to Elisa at the same time if she's losing her mind saying anyone would bite the dust from that shit. Ash says Rick did indeed die, but you brought his ass back to life with your healing magic right after he kicked the bucket. That's how Rick became stronger than anyone else by breaking through his damn limits. Mazette agrees that Rick's a damn hard worker as he remembers the time he kicked him off a cliff, telling him to feel the wind on his skin to up his magic control. And Alice chucked a massive boulder at him during a spar, he died both times, but Ash revived him. But somehow, he managed to survive Renet's brutal training. Rick wraps it all up by spilling these stories to Raster, who just laughs and tells him to ditch the adventuring job and start writing fantasy tales instead. He asks Rick what kept him going through all that hellish training, and Rick proudly declares that his dream of taking down the ultimate beast known as Kaiser Alcipete pushed him through it all. Raster laughs at him, saying that the monster called Kaiser in the book about the hero Yamato who fought him is just some fairy tale. Rick says he doesn't give a damn about what anyone else thinks because beating Kaiser is still his dream. Raster's had enough now, so he decides to end the battle with his next move. He ties Rick with some strong-ass vines and starts chanting this spell for a class 8 magic which is as high as humans can go. Rick recognizes the spell Raster's chanting, but it's too late because thick branches start sprouting behind him, forming a massive golem. Raster hops inside the golem, ready to finish Rick once and for all. In response, Rick gets ready to blast him with a class 1 wind magic shot. Raster laughs and says that weak-ass magic ain't gonna save him. 
Rick asks him how many damn times he's practiced his spell because he's practiced that air shot a hundred million times. Ain't nobody believing that crazy ass number, but Ash confirms it's true, and they use some special time space magic to make it happen. Raster don't give a damn, and he unleashes his golem's magic fist on Rick. Rick manages to break free from the restraints and counters the golem's punch with his wind shot. Their attacks seem equal in strength, but suddenly the wooden golem starts splitting apart. Rick's air shot overpowers the class 8 magic and shatters the whole damn golem, sending Raster flying off. The dude crash lands in the stands, leaving everyone in the crowd shocked. Later, Rick goes to meet up with his crew, who congratulate him on his win. Elise is there too, and she tells Rick he was hella cool earlier. Just then, Raster shows up, limping and struggling from the beatdown he took before. Rick calls out to him and says the reason he won against a genius like him is because he practiced way harder. He says even though he can only use one attack, he practiced that shit way longer than anyone else and mastered it fully. Rick advises Raster to start training on one spell at a time, and the frustrated examiner just walks right past him. He tells Rick that on their next promotion exam, they're gonna meet again, and that time he's gonna definitely beat him. The dude limps away with his two siblings following, but Angelica bows to Rick, and that shit confuses him. Later that night, they announce the results for the e rank promotion exams, and Rick waits patiently for his number to be called with Rionette by his side, while his crew is already off celebrating. Then as the names get called out one by one, Rick seems hella chill. Rina asks him how he went from being a nervous wreck during the test to suddenly being all calm. He tells her he just remembered something important and starts reminiscing about a story he read back in his childhood. A story was about this adventurer named Yamato, and it mentioned the name of the sickest monster in the whole damn world, Kaiser. They said whoever beats that ultimate monster can get a treasure that grants all their wishes. That story got Rick all pumped up, and he went and told his parents about his dream of becoming an adventurer. But his parents weren't down with that shit, just like everyone's parents. His dad says that this book and its stories are fairy tales. There is no ultimate monster or treasure or shit. And his mom was all worried about him risking his life and didn't want him in danger. So they straight up told Rick to find a real stable job. And that crushed his spirit. But then one day a doctor tells Rick that he has some unique trait inside him. But they ain't sure when it's gonna kick in. That idea of having this special trait made Rick even more determined to become an adventurer. He figured that when his trait finally activates and he gets his inherent skill, he's gonna prove his parents wrong. So the next day, Rick starts bragging to his school friends about his skill, even though it ain't activated yet, and they start asking him if it's kicked in yet. Rick tells them to chill and have patience because good things take time. But as the days turn into weeks, then months, and his skill is still dormant, he starts losing hope. Years go by and Rick enters his teenage years, but his skill still ain't showing up. That shit got him stuck in a constant state of depression. His friends try to console him by saying that sometimes, even if you got the trait, the skill never activates. But that doesn't help his depression one bit. They suggest he should still try becoming an adventurer even without the skill, because they say adventurers can still make a lot of money. But for Rick, it ain't about the money, bro. It's about something deeper. The time kept passing by, and Rick landed himself a job as a guild receptionist, and let me tell you, his old school parents were ecstatic about it. So he starts his life as a bland office worker, dealing with a mountain of paperwork every damn day and helping out all sorts of adventurers. And in the midst of all that, he keeps trying to unlock his inherent skill. But it's like he's hitting a solid brick wall. He's drifting further and further away from his dream and losing all of his passion for life. But then a glimmer of hope appears when Hadalisa joins the guild as his junior. But while Rick's still flying solo without a girlfriend, all his buddies start popping out kids left and right. Then one day he finally closes his favorite book, the one that fueled his dream of becoming the illest adventurer, and he shells it, never to crack it open again. One day he helps out the newbie Elisa with her work, dropping some knowledge as her senior. He also tells her to get ready for posting emergency quests because the monster hunting season is around the corner. Just as she bounces, Rick's adventurer homie Zade shows up all hyped up and shit. He's flashing his B-rank medal, bragging about finally getting promoted, and Rick, hiding his envy like a boss, gives him props and congrats him. Later that night, Rick gets wasted and starts comparing himself to Zaid, who started his adventure when Rick started his receptionist job. For the past decade, Rick's been stuck in his job, doing the same repetitive shit day in and day out, while other people out there living the life he always wanted. Rick lays his ass down on the cool grass, gazing up at the sky, thinking that even though he ain't get what he wanted, at least he got a stable job and no major gripes about life. But then his mind starts wandering, wondering what would've happened if he became an adventurer, but he decides it's pointless to dwell on that. Right at that moment, Rick hears some people screaming about a monster attack, and he jumps to his feet and rushes to help them because he thinks he knows what's going down. So my man Rick heads straight into the danger zone, thinking he's about to face some weak-ass low-ranked monster.
but he gets the shock of his life when he comes face to face with a freaking giant troll, a mid-rank monster. Panic starts creeping up on him when suddenly this white-haired maid struts by fresh from her grocery run. Rick jumps in front of her, trying to be all heroic and protect her from the monster, but this baddest maid ain't having it. She tells him to step aside, and she goes and slices that giant troll into a million pieces like it's nothing. Then she tells the shocked Rick that she appreciates the thought of saving her, but she's an adventurer and doesn't need any help. And that's when Rick meets Rionette for the very first time. So he walks her home, showing his gratitude for saving his sorry ass. They introduce themselves, and Rick can't help but ask Rionette if she's a B-rank adventurer because she's mad strong. But Rinet goes and whips out her S-rank medal, leaving Rick dumbfounded. S-rank adventurers are on a whole another level. They're so elite that their names are taken off the guild registry, and they deal with the main office directly. After Rick recovers from his shock, he musters up the courage to ask Rinet a question, begging her not to laugh. Rinet tells him she ain't laughed since she was eight and tells him to spill it. Nervously, Rick spills his guts about his dream to defeat Kaiser and his dormant trait skill. He asks Rinet if a dude like him, in his 30s, can become an adventurer. Rinet tells him that when he tried to save her earlier, he showed he's got the courage to be an adventurer. But since he's in his 30s, his magic reserves ain't gonna improve anymore. And because of that, Rinet straight up tells Rick he ain't gonna make it as an adventurer. That crushed him, man. His last connection to his childhood dream shattered right there. But he acts all relieved like he's glad to finally give up his dream after getting some expert opinion. He tries to change the subject by cracking a joke, saying they should grab dinner together sometime. And get this, Rinet surprises him by actually agreeing. She can suggest they go tomorrow. That puts Rick in one hell of a good mood the next day. And at night, he's bouncing with joy as he heads to Rinette's place. But damn it, a bunch of peeps come running from that direction, yelling about a monster attack, and Rick's heart sinks. He rushes to the scene only to find out that Rinette already took care of business. Right at that moment, a bunch more monsters start creeping out of the forest. Rinette tells Rick to find some damn shelter because he ain't gonna be no help out here. Then she pulls out these needle-sized blades from her thigh straps, and with just those tiny things, she starts slicing and dicing those giant monsters like it's a freaking breeze. Rick's jaw drops and he can't believe what he's seeing, but before he can process it all, Rinette's hit with a surge of mana that brings back all her PTSD from when her whole village got wiped out by a monster. She's screaming and suffering in pain, so Rick rushes over to support her. And out of nowhere, this massive ape monster shows up, ready to pounce on Rick and Rinette. But Zaid swoops in just in time and saves their asses. Zaid asks Rick why the hell he chose this monster-infested spot for his date. Then he tells Rick to step back while he handles things. Two more adventurers show up to back him up and together, they unleash their powers and freeze those monsters using ice magic. Then Zaid enchants his axe with wind magic and slices through them like butter. While Rick's feeling all jelly watching these adventurers in action, Rionette tells him they got danger coming their way, and they gotta evacuate. She straight up tells him that the B-rank adventurers around here ain't got what it takes to fight the monster that's coming. Rick asks her what the hell she's talking about, and she tells him that a freaking dragon is heading their way. Rick can't believe it, even though she explains that whenever she senses a dragon's mana, her trauma takes over and messes with her control over her own mana. And then a massive dragon appears in the freaking sky, and everyone's shaking in their boots. Zaid lays down the unwritten rule of the adventurer guild. If you face a dragon, when you are below A rank, you haul ass and run for your life. But his magician buddy gets all scared shitless, and does the dumb thing of attacking the dragon. That just pisses off the dragon and it lets out a roar so loud that the shockwave knocks everyone flat on their asses. Zaid tells them all to book it, but they ain't fast enough because the dragon throws up a barrier to trap them. Zaid swings his axe at the barrier, but it's like hitting a brick wall and nothing happens. The freaking dragon starts getting closer and Zaid straight up accepts that this is gonna be the end for them. But out of nowhere, Rick starts walking toward the dragon. He says he might have lived his whole life as a damn receptionist. But if he's gotta face this dragon, he's gonna die like a true adventurer. Honestly, the dude's scared as hell, but deep down, he feels a tiny flame burning inside him, pushing him forward. In that moment, Rick feels like this is the life he always wanted for himself. He grabs a Dan rock and tosses it at the dragon. Now it doesn't do shit to the dragon, but it gets Zaid and the other two adventurers fired up. They start attacking the dragon too, but their hits ain't doing any shit against this beast. The dragon breathes fire at them. And even though Zaid tries using his iron body defense skill, everyone gets knocked the hell out. Rainette's cursing herself for being useless in the fight. When out of the rubble, Rick rises up and walks toward the dragon, talking about his dreams. The dragon straight up crushes him under its paw, but instead of killing Rick, that shit actually unlocks his hidden skill. Rick hears the freaking universe speak to him, telling him he's obtained his skill, and then he rises up like nothing, lifting the dragon's heavy-ass paw with just one hand. 
Reenad sees mana overflowing from Rick's body and she's just as confused as the rest of them. But Rick's feeling all confident. He challenges the dragon, saying it's gonna be the damn practice dummy for his newly awakened skill. The dragon breathes fire at him, but Rick easily blocks it with a barrier. The dragon ramps up its flames, but that shit doesn't even scratch Rick's barrier. And then he straight up punches his mana at the dragon with so much power that he leaves a freaking hole where its head used to be. The dragon crashes to the ground and everyone's in shock watching Rick stand there like a freaking hero. But damn, right after all that, Rick passes out from all the stress. When he finally wakes up after a whole damn week, he's in a world of hurt. Luckily, Renette's right there by his side, filling him in on what went down. She tells him he was knocked out cold for a whole week and she stuck around the whole time waiting for him because she wanted to recruit him for her crew called The Fist. She lays it all out for him, saying this ultimate monster named Kaiser is real, and their party's one goal is to defeat that beast one day. Because Rick's got that never give up attitude and ain't afraid to step up to danger, Renette believes he's got what it takes to get stronger and fight alongside them. She tells him he can still become a full-on adventurer and Rick's blown away by her words because nobody's ever said that shit to him before. The tears start flowing as he realizes he can finally chase after his dream. And just as his flashback ends, they call out his name on the loudspeaker, announcing that he passed the exam. As they head back, Renette throws some props his way, but Rick can't take his eyes off that E-rank adventurer medal in his hand because now he's achieved the first part of his childhood dream, he's officially become an adventurer. The scene then shifts to Link's trekking deep into the mountains. He's kind of shocked, thinking Rick actually lives around here. Flashback to after the exam, Rick told Lynx about his place. And Lynx says that they should have the drink that they promised to celebrate this. Rick happily agreed but wondered where they should have it. Lynx suggested going to Rick's place because he is curious about his team. But Rick made this awful face and told Lynx to bring his best game gear if he wanted to visit. Back in the present, Lynx is scratching his head, wondering why Rick threw him off like this. And the map Rick gave him leads straight to the Demon Lord's castle. Link starts doubting if Rick messed up the directions and heads to the castle, feeling a bit iffy. He rings the doorbell and Rick opens up, apologizing for dragging him all this way. As they walk, Link's is surprised that there are no monsters lurking around. And Rick explains that the monsters stay clear of this place, so Link's is puzzled about why he needs this gear then. Rick says this to ensure he makes it back home safe, which makes Link's a bit uneasy. They step into the castle and Reenette greets them. Alice shows up next, all lively and cheerful. Lynx hopes her daughter can grow up with that same energy. But Alice then casually throws out some level 6 magic, and Rick jumps in to shield Lynx from it. Rick scolds Alice for using magic indoors, and she blames him for not hanging out with her. Lynx is taken aback by the scene, and Renette tells Alice she'll be deducting the cost of the damage from her meal, and Alice quickly apologizes and pleads not to cut down her food. Rick tells Lynx he'll be sticking with Alice for a bit so she doesn't pull another stunt. Renette then leads Lynx to the guest room. Lynx thinks the castle is huge and notices Mazette hanging around outside. He heads over and wonders what Mazette's holding in his hand. Mazette spots him and recognizes him as Rick's buddy. He mentions that this RPG thing is his hobby, and making stuff like this is his jam. Then we see Lynx tries to fire the RPG, following Mazette's instructions. Mazette tells him to focus his mana in it and pull the trigger. When Lynx pulls the trigger, the recoil sends him flying backward. He's stunned by the destruction the weapon causes. Mazette thinks it's a solid model, but needs less recoil. Lynx comments that if this thing gets mass-produced, it could change the whole game of war. Next, we see Lynx wandering through the castle's hallways, thinking everyone here is pretty strange. Then he spots Ash buried in books in his study. Ash notices Lynx peeking and invites him in, and Lynx is blown away by the sheer number of books. Ash says this is his room and being surrounded by books helps him chill out. Lynx thinks of Ash as a real brainiac and wonders if he's part of Rick's crew. He then asks if Ash has read all the books, and Ash says he's read most but hasn't caught up with the latest ones because he's been busy training Rick. Lynx is surprised Ash is handling Rick's training. Ash asks if Lynx is interested, and Lynx says he is, asking Ash to train him too. Ash likes the sparkle in Lynx's eyes. It reminds him of Rick and agrees to take him on. Later, Rick finds out Ash took Lynx to the woods and starts worrying about his soon-to-be dead friend. We then see Lynx falling off a cliff with weights tied to his legs, thinking he's done for. But he lands on a monster, saving himself. He notices Renette is carrying the dead monster and realizes it's supposed to be her dinner. He thanks her for saving his life, then she sees the weights and figures out Ash is behind this. Lynx explains Ash told him to run down the cliff like it's a slope and then pushed him. He says he would have died if not for Renette, and Renette agrees, mentioning Ash is responsible for most of Rick's deaths. Lynx pretends he didn't hear that, then Ash comes back and asks if they should continue training, and he drags Lynx away. In the evening, Lynx is totally wiped out, and Rick says he warned him about this. Lynx mentions that Ash promised to go easy on him, but Rick tells him not to trust those words. 
He's been duped by them plenty of times himself. Ash chimes in, saying he's just exaggerating, and that even if things got really bad, he could just revive Lynx without a hitch. Rick questions if Ash doesn't value a person's life at all. Alice then asks Rick if she can play with this old dude, but Rick refuses, knowing she'll turn him into dust. Mazette points out it's Rick's fault for bringing his friend here, as he should have known that things would turn out like this, and Rick agrees with him. Later, Renette serves tea to Rick and Lynx and heads off to prepare dinner. Lynx comments on how amazing Renette is and wonders how far Rick's gotten with her. Rick says they're not like that, insisting she's not interested in him because he's just an old guy in his 30s. Lynx tells him there's nothing wrong with that, revealing his own wife is 20 years younger than him. Rick's surprised by this, and Lynx says it's all about timing and mutual feelings. Hearing this, Rick feels encouraged. The scene shifts to dinner, and Lynx prays Rianette's cooking, and Ash and the others ask for seconds. Rianette goes to get more food, and Lynx suggests Rick should help her out. He says showing consideration for her might close the gap between them, so Rick heads after her. Lynx then asks the others about Rick's inherent skill and wants to see it. He finds out Rick's skill only activates in specific situations and can't be used at will. Lynx is still jealous that Rick has any skill at all, and Ash tells him that even without his skill, Rick is still an S-ranker. But if he activates his reckless soul skill, he can surpass even them. After dinner, Ash asks Lynx if he knows about the six grand orbs. Lynx vaguely remembers reading about them in The Legend of Yamato and thinks they sound like fairy tale stuff, but realizes they must be real if Ash is talking about them. Rick then fills him in that their mission is to take down Kaiser Alsapiet and the six grand orbs are the key to unlocking the dungeon called Source Spiral, where Kaiser Alsapiet is resting. Mazette adds that the six grand orbs activate every 200 years and we're in that cycle right now. They should be giving off strong mana, and Rick wonders if Lynx has heard anything about this. Lynx doesn't recall hearing anything like that but says he'll check with the secret intelligence on non-public quests. Ash thanks him for that, and then Rick asks if Lynx has any advice for him on how to deal with Rionette, since he couldn't help her in the kitchen since she's perfect at everything. The scene shifts to an F-rank adventurer named Race Lucas cleaning the guild. She's not thrilled with her job because she signed up to fight monsters, not clean. She sees Ash, Alice, and Rick try and take a quest, but the guild master tells them they can't take it. Ash is confused about why they can't take a difficulty 82 quest. Then Race wonders why the guild master is bowing to them. And Rick then spots that the quest is for a party of four and suggests they could take it if they get a temporary member. So Ash asks the guild master for help finding a temporary member, and the guild master pushes Reese into the role, saying it's a great chance for her to take on a dangerous mission since she's always asking for one. But he doesn't even wait for her response and practically drags her along. Reese wonders if she's supposed to go with the talking orc, and the guild master tells her to show respect since they're superior adventurers. Reese thinks the orc must be the special one, and the other two are just an old man and a kid, so she puts on a high and mighty attitude, saying she'll help them. Later, they head over to the quest location. On the way, Reese asks if they're on a treasure hunt or something. Rick explains they're after some magic crystals. Apparently, someone they know tipped them off that one of these crystals is somewhere around here. Reese is curious if the crystal's gonna be worth a lot. Rick says yeah, but warns it's risky since these crystals can attract monsters. Reese just laughs it off, saying she got no worries. She claims she can handle any monster, and even though she's an F-ranker now, she'll hit a rank in no time. She asks Rick what rank he is, and he says he just got bumped to E-rank recently. Reese thinks to herself that he's just a late bloomer and hopes she doesn't end up like him. Then they spot the glow from the Grand Orb. Back at the castle, Renette is cleaning windows, hoping Rick and the crew are doing okay. Mizette is also at the castle, working on some gadget he made, and he then stealthily sends a pipe under Renette's skirt. He uses the pipe to blow air up her skirt trying to sneak a peek at her panties. Just as he's about to get a view, Rina catches him in the act. She asks what the gadget is for, and Mazette says it's just a device to make wind without using mana. Rina thinks it's interesting, but then slices it into pieces, putting an end to Mazette's sneaky attempt. The scene shifts back to Rick and the team running into a wyvern on their path. Ash figures the crystal might be in the wyvern's nest. Reese freaks out, hiding because one wyvern is already bad news, and the nest nearby could mean it might summon more of them. Ash coolly walks up to the wyvern, and Reese wonders if he's got a plan. Dwayne Johnson takes out the wyvern with one punch and says that was his plan. Reese is stunned and warns him the wyvern's gonna call for backup. Ash explains that's why he left it alive, which blows Reese in mind. Ash starts getting annoyed with Reese and asks Rick to take her away. Rick guides her out of the forest, and Reese asks why they didn't mention they'd be dealing with wyverns. Rick reminds her that she bragged about being strong, but Reese says that's her goal for the future. Just then, a wyvern corpse comes flying at them, leaving Rice totally shocked. Inside the forest, Ash and Alice are wrecking wyverns like they're just training dummies. Reese is in total shock, seeing how these wyverns are getting tossed around. 
Then a Red Wyvern shows up, but Rick saves Reese, and Reese explains that Red Wyverns are supposed to be as tough as dragons. Rick swoops in to save Rice from the Red Wyvern. Reese is freaking out, warning him that an E ranker like him doesn't stand a chance against a dragon. Rick just tells her to get out of there, but seeing his determination, she decides to stick around and fight. She says she doesn't want to ditch her friends like Yamato would never do, and Rick's got to respect that. Rick nods and tells her to back him up while he fights. But before she can even get into position, Rick nails the Wyvern with a single punch, taking it down in one hit. He realizes just how powerful he really is, while Reese is left wondering why he even bothered asking for support. The next day, we catch Reese back at the guild, cleaning up. The guild master comes over, thanking her for handling the quest. He notices she's got something on her mind and asks her about it. She spills that a lot went down yesterday, and the guild master smirks, saying that's par for the course when those guys are involved. Reese remembers that after they dealt with the wyverns, Rick and the others left with one of the wyverns to cook up for dinner. She's surprised they eat wyverns, and the guild master explains that Rick's team is the strongest on the continent, as rank monsters themselves. He hopes she's learned her lesson and will start taking on quests that match her level. Reese, though, is determined to become an S ranker herself, so she declares she'll start with the E rank exam and heads off to train. Meanwhile, Rick and the squad have found one of the grand orbs named Crimson Blossom. Mizette is feeling a massive surge of mana from it. Then Ash suggests they should be able to locate the other orbs by sensing this one with mana. So Mizette uses his earth mapping spell and the crystal to track down the locations of the other orbs. The map reveals their next destination, Heractopia. And Ash explains that Heractopia is renowned for its Coliseum and its passion for combat sports. We then see Angelica in action, taking down her opponent in the Coliseum of Heractopia. Then we know that 400 years ago, when the land was still a barren desert, the fourth king, Alexander Heractopia, built a coliseum in the town of Knuckle Percy. Tournaments were held there and King Alexander himself participated there, and he was known for fighting with nothing but his own fists. He became a legend, racking up an unbeatable winning streak of 10,000 victories. People flocked from all over the continent to witness his prowess, and soon, the country grew large and vibrant, eventually becoming the nation of Heractopia. Fast forward to the present, we find Rick, Ash, and Rionette exploring Heractopia. They come across a statue of Alexander, famously dubbed the Fist King. Ash is impressed and wishes he could have faced the legendary king, but Rick quickly points out that such a match would likely end with Ash accidentally destroying the entire country. Rionette chimes in, explaining that Alexander didn't just build the country, he also popularized fist fighting. In fact, martial artists are so respected in Heractopia that many people have taken up the profession proudly calling themselves fighters. Ash marvels at how awesome the country is but reminds everyone to stay focused on their mission. They try asking a passerby about the grand orbs, but the person takes one look at Ash, freaks out, and bolts. Clearly, this approach isn't working. So Rick suggests they head to the town hall to gather information, and Ash agrees. But just as they're about to go, they spot a bald guy trying to act all tough while hitting on a girl who's clearly not interested and just wants to be left alone. Ash steps in and asks the bald guy about the orbs, but the guy, feeling threatened, assumes Ash is picking a fight. He talks tough, saying he's not scared of an orc, and suggests they settle it in the back alley, and happily, Ash agrees. A loud thud is heard shortly after, and Ash drags the now-beaten bald guy back out. Afterward, Ash, with a casual but commanding tone, tells the baldy he wants to ask him something. The baldy, thoroughly humbled, introduces himself as gold, and the girl who had been the focus of the earlier confrontation introduces herself as Milchia. Rick shows them the grand orb they've collected, and Ash asks if they've ever seen another crystal like it. Both Gold and Milchia take a closer look, thinking it seems familiar. Milchia mentions she's seen it multiple times but can't quite remember where. Ash, with a hint of urgency, asks her to try and recall since the orb is special to them. Milchia blushes at this, clearly smitten by Ash. Their conversation is suddenly interrupted by the announcement parade for the Fist King Tournament, and they learn the tournament is just two months away. Gold and Milchia are visibly excited, so Rionette curiously asks what the Fist King Tournament is all about. Gold explains that it's a prestigious tournament to crown the champion among fighters, and Milchia adds that it draws a crowd of about 500,000 spectators every year. They inform the group that the man leading the parade is Kelvin Erwolf, the current champion, who has won the tournament five times and is riding a three-year winning streak. As Kelvin strikes a pose in front of the town during the parade, Gold idolizes him, dreaming of being just like him one day. Even Ash can sense Kelvin's strength and capability. Milchia suddenly gasps, catching everyone's attention. Rick asks what's wrong, and she points out something on Kelvin's championship belt. The very orb they're searching for is embedded in it, and Rick is stunned at this discovery. After the parade, Kelvin enters the gym where he meets his master. 
The master apologizes for making Kelvin participate in the tedious parade every year, but Kelvin brushes it off, saying it's part of a fighter's duty to ensure everyone enjoys the tournament. His master then inquires about his condition and Kelvin says that he is fine, but his master senses that he is not in his usual shape. Kelvin mentions he'd feel a lot better if there were a strong opponent waiting for him this time. Just then, Rick and his friends walk into the gym and Kelvin is caught off guard when he sees them. They wonder if they can talk to Kelvin, but the master thinking they're just some overzealous fans tries to kick them out. Rick trying to smooth things over explains that they're not fans. They're adventurers on the hunt for a specific jewel. But Ash, tired of Rick's tiptoeing, straight up tells Kelvin to hand over his belt. The master now suspicious, thinks they're here to steal it. Rick scrambles to explain, but Ash cuts him off, bluntly stating that it's the jewel on the belt they're after. He explains it belonged to a member of their crew, and they've been tracking it down for years. Ash even offers to swap it out for something even more valuable, but the master isn't having it, calling their offer nonsense and telling everyone to kick them out. Kelvin, staying calm, tells everyone to chill. He says that his nose is special, and it's telling him that they're being straight with him, but that doesn't mean he's handing over the belt. He explains that the belt is a big deal in Heractopia, and even though they just want the jewel, it's not something he can just give away. If they want it, they'll have to earn it by winning the Fist King tournament. Ash gets it and starts to leave, but Rick is still worried, asking how they're going to snag the orb now. Ash with a smirk says the answer is obvious. They're joining the tournament. After they leave, the master grumbles about their lack of manners, saying they need a good lesson while they're still young. But Kelvin dead serious tells him that if they'd pushed things, everyone in that room would be dead right now. The master is shocked and realizes they were dealing with something else entirely. Kelvin goes on to say that the dull-looking guy's body was trained to a ridiculous level, but he didn't have that typical strong person vibe, making him hard to read. And the maid, just from her presence, he knew she was packing some serious power. As for the orc, Kelvin just calls him a freaking monster. Afterward, Ash lays out the plan to Rick and Rionette. They're going to become fighters, crush the tournament, and snatch that belt. But first they need to qualify. He explains that to enter the tournament, they have to pass the qualifiers, held in the east and west parts of the country. Then they'll have to win a league made up of the people who also pass the qualifiers. Only then can they enter the main event. Ash decides he'll take on the east qualifiers, leaving Rick to handle the west. Rick agrees but can't help but wonder if Ash will be okay on his own. Ash reassures him, saying he's already arranged for a guide. Right on cue, Gold shows up with a flashy carriage ready to escort Ash. With that, the two bald buddies roll out together. The scene then shifts to Rick on his way to take the fighter test. Rinet fills him in, saying that people from all over the continent come to compete in this tournament and Rick can't help but think it's going to be interesting. Rick enters the testing arena, and the examiner explains that the test will be a mock battle against a newcomer fighter. Rick asks if his opponent is strong, and the examiner tells him that she seems to be, having won every qualifying match so far. But there's no need to stress, wins and losses don't count here. They're just there to judge his ability. Just then, Rick's opponent steps into the arena, bragging that she's earned the nickname Lightspeed in this town. Rick immediately recognizes her voice and realizes it's Angelica. She's horrified to see that Rick is her opponent. Meanwhile, an old man in the stands is cheering for Angelica, like he's one of her fans. A guy named Nicholas joins him, surprised to see his friend watching the mock battles. The old perv admits he couldn't pass up the chance to see Angelica in action, going on about how beautiful she is despite her flat chest. He's convinced that her opponent doesn't stand a chance, but Nicholas wisely warns him not to underestimate the novices. There's always the chance for a dark horse to surprise everyone. Angelica, still in shock, asks Rick what he's doing here, and he fires the question right back at her. He wonders if her brothers are also around, but is relieved to find out they're not. But Angelica, on the other hand, is mortified that she has to face the old man who took down her brother Raster, a top-rank A-class fighter. She's determined not to lose even if the outcome doesn't technically count. The mock battle begins, and Angelica can't shake the thought that Rick doesn't look tough from any angle. She decides not to be careless like last time and goes all out from the start, attempting to use her blink step. But out of nowhere, she trips and falls. Confused, she tries again, only to fall once more. That's when it hits her. This isn't just clumsiness. Rick calmly explains that this is a new move he mastered a few months after the E-rank exam. He calls it one of his eight holding back moves, the starting foot sweep. He adds that it's designed to make his opponent lose the will to fight by sweeping their feet endlessly, and the best part, it barely hurts at all. Angelica can't believe he's treating her like a child and is shocked that even a second-class knight like her couldn't see his foot sweeps coming. She tries to keep her distance and fight back, but it's no use. Rick sweeps her feet again and again. Angelica, refusing to give up, keeps getting back up only to be swept off her feet every single time. 
Rick is impressed by her determination and decides it's time to get serious. But just as he says that Angelica gets terrified and quickly surrenders. Rick wins the match and officially passes the test to become a fighter. As he's leaving, Angelica catches up to him with tears in her eyes. She demands to know why he's here, and before he can answer, she starts crying, wondering aloud how many times he's going to humiliate her. Rick, panicking at the scene she's causing, tries to calm her down and, in a desperate attempt to stop the misunderstanding, offers to treat her to dinner. The scene shifts to a cozy tavern where Milcha serves up some food, casually mentioning she'll give them a little extra since her parents own the place. Rick thanks her for helping them find an inn, and Milcia is curious and asks about Ash. And when she hears he's off competing in the East League, she looks a bit bummed out. Angelica is still puzzled and asks Rick again why he decided to become a fighter. He casually drops that he's aiming to win the Fist King tournament, which leaves her completely shocked. She can't believe he's talking about something so serious like it's no big deal. As Rick and Rianette dig into their meals, they both rave about how amazing the food is. Rianette then turns to Angelica and asks when she decided to become a fighter. Angelica explains that she made the switch four months ago, right after the E-rank test. Rinette is surprised since Angelica is a knight with a sword and all, but Angelica hints that she's got her own reasons for joining the tournament. Rick encourages her to keep pushing herself, but Angelica suddenly gets skeptical and asks if Rick really plans to compete in this year's tournament. When he confirms, she quickly tells him it's impossible, even for him. She breaks it down, explaining that the road to the Fist King tournament is tough, with fighters needing to win 40 matches in the league within just six months. Rick's still not seeing the issue, so Angelica explains that the league fights are brutal and most fighters can barely manage 10 fights in a month. Rick's confidence takes a hit as he realizes the challenge ahead, especially since he's already signed up for 40 matches in just 4 days. Angelica is absolutely floored by this, thinking he's totally lost it. The scene then shifts to Rick at the reception, where he's trying to get the lowdown on his qualifying match. The receptionist directs him to building B. And when Rick asks about his opponent, the receptionist lets him know his opponent is a guy named Grit Albert. And there is some chatter about Grit using illegal weapons, but they couldn't find anything during the body check, so it's just rumors at this point. Cut to the arena and Rick is facing off against Grit. He scans his opponent but doesn't spot any weapons. Grit, on the other hand, gets a little too eager at the thought of taking down a newbie, because he sizes up Rick and assumes he's just a rookie who decided to jump into the fighter gang late in life, so maybe there's some personal reason driving him. Then Grit pulls out his dirty little secret, an impact stone hidden in the sole of his shoe. He proudly explains that this baby can multiply his punching power by a dozen times. As the match kicks off, Grit tosses his jacket at Rick to blind him and then goes in for a full force punch using the impact stone. He's feeling pretty confident until he realizes his hand is the one that's broken. Rick quickly figures out what happened. He tells Grit that using an impact stone without properly training your body is a quick way to break your own bones. Grit is confused, insisting that he shattered a boulder with a stone earlier, but Rick just shrugs it off and says it's his turn now. Grit starts to panic as Rick steps up his game. Rick decides to use his second hold back technique, a swing and miss punch. He explains that this move can knock someone out cold just by creating a shockwave that shakes their brain without causing any real harm. Sure enough, Grit is knocked out, leaving the crowd and a certain onlooker named Nicholas stunned. Nicholas can't believe what he's seeing and realizes someone incredible has just entered the scene, then the referee declares Rick the winner. Meanwhile, over in the Shady Pleasure District, a man approaches a bizarre creature named Keith, who looks like did have a very wild night, and tells him that it's time for him to get to work. The next match is between Angelica and a Karat Boy. The match begins with the Karat Kid leaping up, aiming to land an axe kick on Angelica. But Angelica is way too fast for him. She uses her blink step to effortlessly dodge the attack, then delivers a swift back kick that sends her opponent crashing into a wall, sealing her victory in seconds. Outside the arena, Rick congratulates her on her win, noting that she's now defeated all 40 opponents, qualifying her for the main tournament. Angelica, still catching her breath, asks if Rick seriously plans on fighting 40 opponents in just four days, because that's practically impossible. Rick, with his usual laid-back attitude, asks what's so impossible about it. Angelica realizes with a sigh that he hasn't done any research about this country. She explains that you can only have one match in an arena per day, meaning to fight 10 matches. You'd have to travel to 10 different arenas, each hundreds of kilometers apart. Rick, still unfazed, mentions that his next arena is only 30 kilometers away, but the kicker? His next match is in just 10 minutes. Angelica is utterly floored, telling him there's no way he can reach it in time, now you him with a carriage. Rick gives her a look that could melt steel with its intensity and yells, why the hell would I use a carriage when I'm in a rush? Without another word, he takes off at incredible speed, 
leaving even Angelica, known for her lightning-fast reflexes, completely stunned. Rianette standing by casually asks if Angelica wants to watch the matches. Angelica, still a bit dazed, nods, mumbling that it seems impossible. But before she can even process what's happening, Rianette grabs her and starts leaping across rooftops, racing toward the next arena. By the time Angelica arrives, the match is already over. Rick has easily defeated his opponent while Angelica, still trembling from the wild ride, collapses onto the floor. But Rick doesn't have time for chit-chat. He's off to the next arena in a flash, with Rinette scooping up Angelica once again. Rick's next opponent barely stands a chance as he's taken down by a simple shockwave. Then it's on to the following arena, where Rick literally runs circles around his opponent until the poor guy knocks himself out. Four days fly by, and Angelica is left utterly shocked. Rick actually pulled it off minus 40 matches in just four days. She's just relieved he's not in the same block as her, because facing him would mean instant defeat. But Renette, ever the realist, points out that Rick isn't even the strongest fighter in the tournament. There's also the orc and S-ranked adventurer who trained Rick to reach this insane level. Angelica, coming to terms with the fact that she's up against literal monsters, asks where Rick has gone today. Rina casually mentions that Rick's off on a quick 600-kilometer jog to a nearby city. Angelica, now so used to Rick's absurd feats, barely bats an eye as she sips her tea. Later that evening, Rick finally returns from his jog, only to be stopped by a slithery lizard man named Snape. Snape introduces himself as the chairman of the West League Committee and congratulates Rick on setting a new record for defeating so many opponents in just four days. As they shake hands, Rick immediately senses that Snape is no ordinary man. He's a warrior. Snape admits he used to fight years ago and even won a small tournament when he was 23, but retired soon after. Now he's a merchant and an old friend of Angelica's family. With a sly grin, he tells Rick to take care of himself and to pass along his regards to Angelica before slipping into his carriage and riding off. Rick walks into Milsha's restaurant looking a bit puzzled. Sensing something's off, Milsha immediately asks if everything is alright. She warns Rick to be extra cautious around Snape. Despite his gentlemanly appearance, she's heard rumors that Snape has ties to the underworld and some shady connections with gangsters. This leaves Rick wondering why on earth Snape would come here just to meet him. As he's deep in thought, Rick overhears some guys chatting excitedly about a new dark elf bunny girl who's apparently stealing everyone's hearts. Rick quickly puts two and two together and realizes it must be his dear Rionette. He rushes to the stadium and sure enough, there she is, Rionette, along with Angelica, both dressed in bunny girl costumes encouraging kids to gamble like it's a Jake Paul stunt. One of the rowdy customers starts getting loud and obnoxious taking a jab at Angelica but she's in no mood for games. She promptly beats the crap out of him, literally stepping on his head and daring anyone else to give it a try. Just then Rick arrives, shocked to see Angelica dressed like that and promoting betting and gambling. But his jaw practically hits the floor when he catches sight of Renette, looking absolutely stunning in her outfit, like the hottest carrot shake ever. Meanwhile, back at the gym, Discount Nick Fury is reading a newspaper about an orc who won 40 matches in just two days, using no more than a single punch each time. He's baffled, wondering what kind of beast they're dealing with. Kelvin then updates him on Rick, who also won 40 bouts in four days, an incredible feat in his own right. This news fires up Kelvin, which triggers a memory for Nick Fury. He recalls the day he found Kelvin in a rough town where he ruled the streets with gang wars. Kelvin was beating the living daylights out of an entire gang. And that's when Nick offered him a shot at better life, bringing him back to this country to fight in the Herectopia arena and earn an honest living instead. The next morning, Renette, Angelica, and Rick sit down for breakfast when Rick casually mentions that snake guy who claimed to know her. Angelica's face tightens at the mention of that name, and she quickly denies knowing anyone by that name, clearly stressed. Later that day, the first main match kicks off with Angelica squaring off against a tough, muscular girl. Renette notices that Angelica looks unusually tense, which is out of character for her. As the match begins, Angelica charges at her opponent, who manages to block the first kick and counter. But Angelica, being the speed demon she is, quickly recovers and lands another powerful kick that sends her opponent crashing into the wall, securing her victory. Next up, Rick faces off against some random fool who thinks wind magic will be his ticket to victory. Rick easily dodges the attacks, slips past him, and delivers a karate chop that barely touches the guy. But it's enough to knock him out cold, dropping him right into Rick's arms like a sack of potatoes. The next few matches fly by as both Angelica and Rick slice through their opponents like butter. By evening, Angelica is utterly drained from all the fights. Rick tries to warn her about her final opponent of the day, but she cuts him off determined to finish what she started. Her final opponent? A massive, grotesque hulk of a man whose face could scare a ghost. But Angelica, ever the fighter, doesn't flinch. 
She immediately goes all out using her blink step to close the distance and leaping into the air to create a water wall around him. The wall quickly engulfs the fatty, Angelica unleashes an electric blast, trying to fry him on the spot. But to her frustration, the guy's skin is ridiculously thick, and he somehow survives the onslaught. Angelica, not one to give up, charges in for another attack. But the fatty, surprisingly nimble for his size, dodges her strikes and lands a colossal punch that sends Angelica flying into the wall, ending the fight with a brutal knockout. Later that night, after getting patched up by the nurse who sternly advises her to take it easy, Angelica steps out of the infirmary only to be immediately confronted by Rick. Why the hell did you fight like an idiot against someone with solid defense? He snaps, clearly frustrated. Angelica, still acting off, brushes him off, telling him to mind his own business as she tries to walk away. But Rick isn't one to back down so easily, and keeps after her, finally wearing down her defenses. She eventually caves and reveals the truth. Snape is her fiancé. After her parents died, her grandfather made a deal with Snape, selling Angelica to him for a massive sum of money, all against her will. Now that the engagement is official, their noble family can't just break it off without bringing shame to their name. That's why she's been digging into Snape's shady business dealings. She tells Rick that Snape is a major sponsor of the tournament, and has planted one of his own fighters in the competition. But Rick doesn't quite see why this matters, until they hear a commotion coming from a nearby tavern. Peeking inside, they spot a red lizard man choking a waitress. The same fatty who had beaten Angelica earlier tries to step in, but the lizard man effortlessly grabs him and slams him to the ground, knocking him out with a single hit. Angelica is shocked but still musters the courage to intervene. As the lizard man moves toward her, ready to throw a punch, Rick steps in and casually catches his arm, telling him to back off. Just then, Snape strolls into the tavern, ordering the lizard man to stand down and save his strength for the tournament. He introduces the lizard as his younger brother, Gaith, who apparently has anger issues but calms down quickly. Snape promises to compensate the tavern owner for the damage and leads Gaith out of the establishment. Angelica then confides in Rick, explaining her suspicions that Snape is involved in match-fixing and is trying to rake in a fortune through his chosen fighter. She admits that she entered the tournament to defeat Snape's fighter and expose his corruption, but now that goal seems increasingly out of reach. To her surprise, Rick looks at her with determination and offers to train her for the upcoming matches, and that makes her wonder if that means that she will die. The next day, Rick warns Angelica that the upcoming training will be tougher than anything she can imagine, but Angelica, full of bravado, tells him not to hold back. But her confidence takes a hit when Rick casually straps some heavyweights onto her, and without missing a beat, Rick advises her to remember her strengthening magic unless she wants to end up dead. Angelica can't help but wish she'd at least explain what the hell they're doing first, but Rick got no time for explanations and he just drags her along as he takes off running. Angelica panics, completely clueless about what's happening, and finally Rick decides to clue her in. He explains that this is all about getting her body used to fast movement by being yanked along by someone faster. Sure, Angelica's got great acceleration, but she loses all stability right after. Angelica then desperately begs him to stop just for a moment. But Rick declares that the secret to rapid improvement is pushing yourself beyond your limits, and he adds with a smile that she doesn't have to worry because there are only six more hours left. When it's finally over, Angelica can't believe her legs are still attached. She was convinced they'd fallen off somewhere along the way. Rick, however, just grins and tells her he went through this exact same torture, and even died three times on his first day. Angelica feels a sliver of pride for surviving that quickly fades when Rick casually mentions that they still have afternoon training lined up right after a short lunch break. Angelica, then on the verge of tears, begs for mercy. But Rick, conveniently hard of hearing, just cheerfully says they'll meet again in an hour. After five grueling days of training, Angelica convinces herself that she didn't run away. No, she just made a tactical retreat to protect her mental health. She is very confident that Rick won't find her, but she quickly realizes just how wrong she is. Rick says that he calmed the entire country for her, but to her utter shock, it's only been 15 minutes since she fled. Rick surprisingly understands why she bolted, because during his two years of training, he did the exact damn thing. He ran away dozens of times, but he also died tens of thousands of times in the process. There was even a time when Alice had to share her mana with Ash, so he could revive Rick another 2,000 times. This led to even more brutal training and countless deaths, so Rick had no choice but to toughen up. He was on the verge of giving up countless times, but Ash always managed to push him forward. Ash would tell him to compare the regret he'd feel if he gave up to his current suffering. The weight of giving up was always heavier, so Rick kept pushing through. Angelica then vents about everything she hates about being a noble. It's because of all those burdens that she decided to contribute to her family as a fighter, not just as a noble lady. So this is why she dreams of becoming the first special class woman knight. 
Angelica doesn't want to feel the crushing weight of regret either, so she's ready to dive back into training. Rick then mentions that Angelica is naturally suited to using a sword, but the tournament doesn't allow weapons. So because of this, Rick decides it's best to teach her techniques that turn her hands into deadly weapons. And to do this, Rick brings in Ryanette to join her training. Fast forward a bit, and it's time for the final match between the top contenders of Block C. This is Angelica's fight, but she's growling like a wild beast for some reason. So Nicholas comments that Angelica's usual elegant fighting style won't work against this particular opponent, but there's something different about her today. The fight begins, and everyone is stunned as she attacks with brute force, instantly claiming victory. Rick is pleased with the results of the training, but Angelica seems to be in some sort of extreme fighting addiction that has gotten out of control. Later, we see Mazette returns after chasing down a lead on one of the other orbs, only to come back empty-handed. Frustrated Mazette then tries to flirt with the waitress, but gets shut down faster than he can say smooth talker. That night, Ash tells Mazette that they'll get their hands on another orb if they win the tournament. Alice wants to join in on the action too, but Rick quickly shuts that down, worried she'd accidentally demolish the whole arena. Rick also mentions that he's been training Angelica, but she's bummed out, thinking there's not enough time to get stronger. The whole crew rallies around her, reminding her that even a bit of training can make a huge difference. Alice is clueless as ever about what they're talking about, but still cheers everyone on to do their best. And after the words of support from everyone, Angelica's ready to give it everything she's got. The next day, the Fist King tournament kicks off. The first matches are announced, and we get a glimpse of who Rick, Angelica, and Geese are up against. Seeing this, Rick breathes a sigh of relief that he doesn't have to go up against Ash, because he knows he'd just throw in the towel if that happened. Ash's opponent is some fishy-looking guy, and his bald friend is in the stands cheering him on. Kelvin also makes an appearance, but someone in the audience seems concerned about his condition. Nick Fury, however, remains unfazed, confident that Kelvin will come out on top no matter what shape he's in. As the crowd starts placing bets, Angelica spots something fishy. Geth has been conveniently placed in a spot where he won't have to face Ash or Kelvin until the final round. The match-fixing is already in full swing, setting up Geth to look unbeatable. Angelica sees right through their plan, they'll make Geth seem like a powerhouse, and when the odds against him are sky-high, Snape will place a massive bet on his opponent. Geth will then take a dive, letting Snape cash in big time. But Angelica's not having it. She's set to face Geth in the second round, and she's determined to throw a wrench in their dirty scheme. A little later, Kelvin mentions how happy he is to see Ash and Rick at the tournament. Ash quickly reminds him that they're all gunning for the belt, and they each look forward to facing off against one another. Nick chimes in, noting that Kelvin's got the look of a true challenger again, and it takes him back to how Kelvin looked years ago. He's talking about the time when he first brought Kelvin to his gym. Nick was boasting about having a fighter from his gym reach the top four in the tournament, and Kelvin was allowed to fight this guy. Kelvin, in his typical overconfident fashion, wondered if he was even allowed to end the guy's life, but of course that's against the rules, just like using a weapon. But those were pretty much the only rules. Kelvin, cocky as ever, told the guy not to be upset after losing, but instead, Kelvin found himself flat on the ground. Kelvin lost that fight, but his ridiculous potential was crystal clear, even though he'd never had formal training before. After his first defeat, Kelvin underwent a transformation, training like a madman to grasp victory. He started looking forward to losing against stronger opponents because it just fueled his drive to train even harder. This relentless pursuit was the life Kelvin had always craved, and his tireless training led to him shocking the world. He ended up decimating the reigning champion in his very first tournament, and it's been six years since then. But Nick is thrilled to see that fire in Kelvin's eyes once more. The first match of the tournament kicks off, and Geik's opponent quickly finds himself fighting like a rabbit. Despite trying to provoke Geith into taking the fight seriously, the guy doesn't stand a chance. Geith with a single swing shocks the entire arena with the sheer power he can generate. Even though the opponent refuses to back down and unleashes a barrage of attacks at lightning speed, it only serves to irritate Geith. And without much effort, Geith delivers another blow, unintentionally knocking the guy out cold. He's declared the winner, leaving everyone wondering if there's ever been a sponsor fighter this powerful. Sure, Geith's strength is undeniable, but Rick senses something off. Despite Geith's overwhelming power and toughness, his movements are those of a complete amateur. Still, Geith wins easily and leaves a lasting impression on the crowd. As the tournament progresses, our heroes dominate their fights, each one moving forward. Finally, it's time for the last match of the first round and all eyes are on Kelvin. The excitement is palpable as everyone is eager to see what he's got. Kelvin wastes no time attacking with blistering speed. Rick can't help but notice that it's as if Kelvin knows exactly what his opponent is going to do before they even move. 
Ash chimes in, explaining just how insane Kelvin really is, able to send shifts in electrical signals and adrenaline just by smell. They all agree that Kelvin is an incredible fighter, but the crowd is stunned when Kelvin suddenly hits the ground. Rick's shock turns to realization as the others explain that Kelvin actually let himself get hit. The crowd roars for Kelvin, and with a smirk, he gets up and quickly knocks out his opponent. Kelvin is announced the winner, but his friends can't help but think he's just toying with everyone. The second round kicks off the next day and Snape arrives, sliding into his seat right next to Rick. He introduces himself to the group, but Alice immediately suspects something's off, wondering why the lizard is putting on a nice guy act, but the lizard just smiles. Rick then puzzled asks why Snape isn't in the VIP seats, so Snape explains that this next fight is crucial. It's between his brother and his fiancé and he needs to see every detail up close. In the halls, Gith is nursing a hangover from the night before when he bumps into Angelica. Geth barely remembers who she is and casually mentions that Snape told him not to mess up her face so she'd still look good at their wedding. So Angelica tells him that she will show him the results of her hard training, but Geth mockingly dismisses her efforts, claiming that no amount of training could ever bridge the gap between their power levels. Angelica thinks he must have trained just as hard given his physique, but she is shocked when Geth reveals that he doesn't train at all. He just lives his life and his body naturally ends up this way. Gath smugly declares himself a natural-born talent and suggests that Angelica stands still during their fight so he doesn't accidentally hit her stomach because he wouldn't want to mess up her ability to bear Snape's children after all. Angelica's blood boils and she vows to utterly destroy him. The match kicks off with the crowd going wild, but Angelica is quickly taken aback when her first strike doesn't even phase Gath. She dodges his counterattack, but once again, her blows seem useless, even when they land squarely on him. Realizing her basic attacks are no match for Gaith, Angelica pulls a move that catches everyone off guard, including Snape, who's watching intently from the stands. She deactivates her strengthening magic, leaving Gaith puzzled about what she's planning. Raynette cheers her on from the sidelines as Angelica taps into her mana reflex inversion. Gaith still cocky tells her to give up, but Angelica unleashes her new thread slicer attack, finally breaking through Gaith's defenses and landing a cut. The crowd erupts in cheers, and Angelica smirks, wondering aloud who Gaith was calling a small fry now. Snape is left speechless because not even the sharpest blade could leave a mark on Gaith's skin, but Rick and Rionette know better, knowing this is exactly what they train Angelica to handle. Flashback to when Rionette first demonstrated the technique to Angelica. It's called the Thread Slash, but Angelica thought Rick was out of his mind for even suggesting she learn it. Rionette explained it wasn't impossible if Rick could manage it, so could she. Rick, however, could never get the precision that Renette had, so Renette told Angelica she just needed to feel the wind when she swung her arm. Angelica struggled with the concept at first but practiced harder than she ever had before. Eventually, she figured out how to blend her other abilities with the move, reinventing the technique in her own style. The Thread Slash is a technique that releases stored magical energy in a short, powerful burst. It takes a heavy toll on the body, but after the ruling training they put her through, it feels like nothing. Angelica's flicker feed ability lets her use the thread slash in a way no one else can. Gaith gets annoyed when she pulls it off again and almost cuts her in half. Snape watches entertain as the battle rages on, but Gaith decides he's done playing games. He sends Angelica flying into a wall and tells Snape he can't help himself when faced with such a lively opponent. Angelica, stubborn as ever, refuses to give up, but Gaith has seen her flicker ability so many times now that he can match her speed. He lands a brutal hit this time, mocking her as mediocre trash. Rick starts to worry for Angelica, but Snape seems pleased that Rick is finally understanding that Gaith's strength is beyond comprehension. Snape recalls meeting his adopted brother Gaith when he was just eight years old, and even then, Gaith would beat him so badly he could barely stand. In fact, Gaith is the reason Snape quit fighting altogether. Gaith is the perfect prodigy, born with every combat talent imaginable, a real monster. And a total jerk too, as he keeps taunting Angelica, calling her worthless trash, saying it'll never change no matter how much she trains and even throwing in insults about her parents for good measure. Stake knows that Angelica thinks he's trying to rig the match to make Gaith lose, but there's no need for that. Gaith is insanely strong. In fact, Snape's done the exact opposite. The odds of a sponsor slot competitor winning are ridiculously low, and everyone bet against Gaith. So Snape took those odds and placed a huge bet on Gaith to win. The crowd watches in shock and horror as Gaith starts giving Angelica a serious beatdown. It's brutal and Rick decides that Angelica has reached her limit. Angelica, however, is still confident that Gaith can't beat her, while Gaith is dead set on breaking her spirit. He wants to show her that no amount of training will let a piece of trash be a natural-born prodigy like him. Angelica doesn't want to have any regrets, just like she told Rick, so she goes for one last punch. Unfortunately, this only makes Gaith more eager to crush her completely. 
Rick tries to stop the match, but it's too late. Gaith begins his final attack. By some stroke of luck, Gaith misses, sparing Angelica's life, but he is still declared the winner. Gaith quickly realizes that Rick was the one who threw his shoe to interfere, but Rick is clearly seething with anger. Angelica is carried away and Rick confronts Gaith in a hallway. Gaith is fuming about the interference, but he's caught off guard when Rick dodges his strike. Rick calm as ever, says there's no need to rush because he plans to take Gaith down in front of the entire crowd. Gaith, equally furious, feels the same way. Rick then goes on to win his next match, while Angelica remains in rough shape. Rick reflects on how hard she trained and can't help but feel for her. Meanwhile, Ash takes out his opponent with a single strike, just like Rick did, and Kelvin flexes his massive power as well. Now only four competitors remain and the semifinals are set for the next day. Rick wraps up some training and notices that Angelica has recovered. He figures Ash must have healed her but warns that any damage deep within her body could still be lingering. It's clear something is weighing heavily on her mind but Rick oblivious as ever, doesn't notice until she speaks up. She confesses that Rick trained her even when he had nothing to gain and she ended up failing. She apologizes for wasting his time and admits she only wanted to prove she could stand on her own two feet. Angelica even tries to convince herself that marrying Snape wouldn't be so terrible, but Rick snaps her out of it. He insists that he's the one who should apologize since he failed to gauge Gaith's real strength before it was too late. Rick then urges her to watch his next match closely, promising it will show her what lies beyond the training she endured. The semifinals finally kick off with Rick facing off against Gaith. Rick is surprised when Gaith says he wants to apologize to Angelica, but it turns out he's only sorry he didn't finish her off. Now she has to suffer through life, tormented by her lack of ability. As the fight starts, Gaith begins taunting Rick, but Rick quickly counters by smashing Gaith's face in. With the so-called prodigy brought to his knees, Rick tells Gaith to stop looking so pathetic. Gaith thinks Rick's just overconfident, but Rick rocks him again with another blow. Angelica watches in shock, realizing Rick's attacks are actually getting through Gaith's iron-like skin, even though Rick hasn't been using his full strength. Rick's attacks are precise and controlled. The force doesn't hit the outside of the body, it drills deep inside. No matter how tough Gaith's body is, Rick's perfectly timed strikes are doing serious damage. Rick even gives Gaith a chance to quit, but Gaith doubles down, using a powerful strengthening magic meant for dragons, making the fight way more intense. The spell burns a lot of magical energy, but that's no problem for Gaith. Snape explains that Gaith has never had to train his magical capacity, he was just born with a huge amount of it. Rick, on the other hand, had to scrape for every bit, prompting Gaith to sneer and tell him to go blame his parents. Rick's next attack is stopped by Gaith's iron body, and Angelica is stunned to see that the lizard managed to learn her technique. The crowd falls silent, and Gaith smugly assumes they're bored watching a prodigy beat up an average fighter. But Ash sees things differently. He points out that Rick doesn't care about the crowd, he only cares about how Angelica sees him. Rick blocks another blow and is satisfied to notice that Gaith is finally showing signs of fatigue. Gaith, on the other hand, is shocked that no matter how hard he hits, Rick doesn't shed a single drop of blood. It turns out Rick is using a special technique that disperses the impact of attacks throughout his body, so he's barely taken any damage. Gaith feels insulted, realizing Rick is clearly holding back. Rick admits he's been limiting his physical abilities to match Angelica's levels because winning isn't the only goal here. He wants to show Angelica her own potential, turning this fight into a kind of virtual rematch between Gaith and Angelica. Naturally, this infuriates Gaith, but Rick just tells him to chill out and plan his next move. Gaith hardens his body for another attack, but Rick shatters his armor into pieces. Rick points out that Gaith has never had to try hard at anything, so feeling this level of exhaustion is new for him. Snape refuses to believe Rick could surpass Gaith in power, but Rick's team argues that Rick doesn't have much innate ability at all. Rick started training long after the ideal time for building his magic reserves had passed, making him technically below average. Snake can't fathom how he's able to outmatch a prodigy like Gaith, but Angelica begins to understand why. Rick tells Gaith that because he isn't used to being tired, he can't maintain his precision. Those who push themselves hard keep going even when they're exhausted, so they move forward until they physically can't anymore. The strength someone has when they're completely worn out, that's their real strength. The clueless lizard Gaith tries to keep attacking, but it's pointless. Rick declares that true prodigies sharpen their skills by putting in relentless effort, just like he's seen with his friends. Gaith has always believed he was the strongest person alive, but in reality he was just facing opponents he could easily beat. Hearing this, Gaith completely loses it and unleashes the most powerful of dragonoid strengthening magics, practically transforming into a dragon. And Snape then reveals that Gaith has tapped into the ancient blood of the dragons. Rick is caught off guard by the surge of power and is stunned when his next punch has no effect on the beast. Gaith's body feels like solid metal and his attacks are now blindingly fast. 
Gaith lucked out being born with such a powerful body, so Rick starts thinking he won't be able to win this fight. Gaith smirks, thinking Rick has finally come to his senses, but Rick clarifies that what he meant was that someone at Angelica's current level can't defeat a dragon. But that doesn't mean Angelica should ever give up. She just needs to keep training for the next time she faces a life or death situation. Rick begins adding months of training bit by bit, gradually ramping up his power. He unleashes the equivalent of 12 months worth of training, moving so fast he becomes nearly invisible. Angelica acknowledges that she isn't at this level yet, but she sees Rick using her flickering feet technique in an incredibly advanced way. This makes her realize that if she continues her brutal training for another year, this could be her strength too. Now that Rick has taken control of the fight, he decides to give Gaith a little lesson. He explains that normal hard work won't bridge the gap between natural-born abilities. It requires the madness to keep pushing for extraordinary effort. Yes, Angelica lost after training herself to the brink for a whole month, but he challenges her to think if she has the guts to endure that same hellish training for a full year just to win. Angelica recalls what Rick said about the regret scale. So she feels inspired and boldly declares that she was born with a scale that only tips in one direction. Rick then knocks Gaith flat on his back and wonders aloud if the lizard has what it takes to push himself through this struggle. But it's clear Gaith hasn't learned a thing, so Rick decides to end the fight once and for all. He uses the thread slash, not as precisely as Angelica, but the attack is still enough to defeat Gaith. Rick tells him he's lucky he isn't facing the Angelica that will exist in a year. And then Rick and Angelica exchange smiles, and with that, Rick announces the winner. The crowd roars in excitement, believing Rick to be incredible, while Gaith is carted off on a stretcher. Angelica turns to Rick, thanking him for winning the match. But he dismisses her gratitude, saying there's no me because he just did his part. She then boldly vows to reach his level of power within a year and even surpass him one day. Rick smiles at her determination and the crowd erupts in cheers once more. Angelica then notices Snape who appears surprisingly calm, and he admits he didn't expect things to turn out this way but confesses that part of him wanted Gaith to lose. He explains he harbored a desire to see Gaith defeated, as his talent had brought an end to Snape's own career as a fighter. So despite losing much today, Snape admits he feels strangely relieved. Alice whispers that it sounds complicated, to which Mazette replies with a knowing smile, that's just how adults are. Snape then sighs, lamenting that he won't be able to make Angelica his wife, to which she quickly retorts that their agreement is off as he can't pay the contract money. But as Snape walks away, he muses that it would have been wonderful to have a beautiful woman like her as his wife, causing her heart to skip a beat. Meanwhile, Kelvin is preparing to enter the arena. His master asks how he feels and Kelvin confidently replies that he feels great. His master reminds him that he is the strongest fighter and urges him to give it everything he has. But Kelvin finds his master's words a bit strange, but decides to respect his wish. The match between Kelvin and Ash begins and the crowd roars with excitement for Kelvin. From the way Ash stands, Kelvin instantly senses his strength. He lunges first with a powerful punch, followed by a rapid flurry of blows. But Ash remains unshaken and counters swiftly, and Kelvin barely manages to dodge. Realizing that Ash might be the strongest opponent he has ever faced, Kelvin braces himself. Suddenly, Gaith bursts into the arena, attacking the audience in a wild frenzy, so Snape wonders if Gaith's dragon blood has driven him mad. As Gaith attacks the audience, panic spreads and people scramble to escape. Kelvin, furious at the disruption, shouts at Gaith for interrupting his match. Gaith charges at him, but Kelvin stops him effortlessly and knocks him out with a single punch. Rick and his party are shocked by Kelvin's strength, with Rick noting that Gaith should be as strong as an A-rank adventurer. So Raynette suggests that this might mean Kelvin has reached the level of an S-rank fighter. The announcer then declares that due to the incident, the match will be postponed until tomorrow. Kelvin is clearly unhappy and Ash comments that he can see uncertainty in Kelvin's fists, which takes Kelvin by surprise. Later. Ash and the others are having lunch and Ash grumbles about the postponement. Mizette tells him not to worry, reassuring him that they will win anyway and obtain the grand orb they need. Angelica wonders where Rick is and Renette explains that he went jogging to Claristhia. Angelica is shocked knowing it's a 700km round trip, but tries to hide her surprise. Meanwhile, Rick is near the country's border where he spots a small mountain that amusingly reminds him of Renette's big melon. He then notices smoke around the mountain and decides to take a closer look. Becky finds Kelvin training by himself and Kelvin is annoyed by Rick's arrival, explaining that he wanted to train in peace. Rick is concerned and hopes Kelvin isn't overworking himself with the match set for tomorrow. So Kelvin admits he's feeling restless because of the delay and suggests sparring with Rick. They exchange blows with Rick blocking Kelvin's attacks and throwing a punch, but Kelvin manages to dodge, surprising Rick with his speed. Rick then wonders how Kelvin could dodge such a fast attack here. It get hit by slower ones in the arena. Jokingly, he asks if Kelvin has a stuffy nose, but Kelvin shouts and says that isn't the issue. 
Kelvin then begins to open up, sensing that Rick might understand since he is also strong, so he reveals that he was born in the slums, where fighting was the only source of fun he ever knew. Things were going smoothly when he first landed in Heractopia. He won his first tournament without breaking a sweat, and then went on to crush his second. Nobody could stand against him, even every fight ended with a single blow. He thought it wasn't so bad as long as his master was pleased, but soon enough the thrill of the matches wore off, and his only joy came from training to get stronger. One day, he overheard his master talking to a staff member from the tournament committee, and that's when he found out that the tournament had been losing its audience because every fight was ending too quickly, and the master bluntly asked if the staff wanted him to tell Kelvin to lose on purpose. The staff member said he just wanted the fights to be more exciting, and warned that if the arena's popularity kept dropping, the gym would suffer too. But the master calmly replied that he would handle it when the time came. In the next tournament's final match, Kelvin decided he didn't want to be a champion if it meant causing problems for his master. So he took a hit from his opponent's fist and pretended to be knocked out. He lost the tournament, and the crowd went wild with excitement, so Kelvin thought, maybe, this isn't so bad. In the following tournament, he figured out how to make his fights more exciting, and he went on to win three tournaments in a row. He explains to Rick that this is why he can't use his full power in a match. Rick laughs and says that strong people really have it tough, but Kelvin shoots back that Rick is in no position to say that. But Rick smirks and adds that Kelvin won't have the chance to hold back in tomorrow's match, then Kelvin wonders if Rick even listened to what he just said, but before he can argue, Rick gives a quick wave and walks off. The next day, the match between Ash and Kelvin begins once more, with a protective barrier installed around the arena for the safety of the audience. As the match starts, Kelvin charges in with a barrage of punches, but they have no effect on Ash. Kelvin then uses an attack called Roll Fong, managing to push Ash's blocking hand aside. Rick is surprised to see this, and Angelica explains that Kelvin used rotation to make his punch more powerful. Then we see Kelvin continue his assault, but Ash dodges and counters only for Kelvin to dodge in return. Kelvin then remarks that Ash is a monster, but Ash smirks and says Kelvin is just the same as yesterday, still holding back. So Kelvin wonders if he heard this from Rick, and it's revealed that Rick has indeed told Ash everything. The audience looks on, puzzled by their conversation. Kelvin admits that Ash's strength is the real deal, but confesses that if he shows his true power now, everyone will realize he's been faking it all along. He assumes Ash must think he's a pathetic professional for deceiving the audience, but Ash surprises him by calling him a true professional for putting the audience's enjoyment first. Still, Ash laments that he can't fight Kelvin at full strength, so he decides to hold back too, vowing to fight with only two fingers and without moving from his spot. He hopes this will make things more interesting and Kelvin accepts the challenge. Kelvin attacks with another barrage of punches, but Ash effortlessly blocks each one with just two fingers. Even the roll fong attack is stopped by those two fingers, and Ash throws Kelvin to the ground. Ash then goes for another punch, but Kelvin narrowly dodges. Kelvin realizes that Ash is incredibly strong and feels the urge to fight with everything he has, but he restrains himself. But suddenly from the stands, his master shouts, telling him he knows exactly what Kelvin is trying to do, and that he's completely misunderstanding the situation. Kelvin thinks he's holding back for his master's sake, but his master shouts that his true goal is to train the strongest fighter in the world. He passionately declares that this is his dream and that he has poured his entire life into it. So he tells Kelvin he wants him to be the strongest and insists that his dream perfectly aligns with what Kelvin truly wants to do. Realizing this, Kelvin decides to give the fight his all, thrilled at the chance to unleash his full strength. He then lands a powerful punch on Ash, who responds by blocking with all five fingers. Kelvin raises an eyebrow, asking if Ash forgot his promise. But Ash grins and replies that he's still using only the amount of strength needed to block. Ash then continues to defend against Kelvin's relentless attacks, even managing to block two of Kelvin's roll fongs at once. Then when Kelvin kicks at him, Ash counters by throwing him, but Kelvin uses his steel body technique to minimize the impact. The audience begins to realize that Kelvin is far stronger than he appeared in his previous fights, so they feel betrayed, realizing he has been deceiving them all along. Kelvin senses their disappointment and thinks there's no turning back now, so he decides to go all out. He casts a fifth nature fire spell, and Angelica is shocked because beastmen aren't supposed to be good at nature magic. Rick watches in amazement, thinking that Kelvin must have trained intensely to achieve this, recognizing that he is a true genius, just like the members of his own party, and Kelvin's master is taken aback by his unexpected power. Ash then quickly enchants a section of the ground to block the fiery attack. Kelvin immediately follows up using Blink Step combined with Stalwart Charge, aiming directly at Ash. But he uses the fist as a feint, and Ash realizes too late that he's been trapped and Kelvin ensnares him with a seventh nature vine magic spell. Rick sees this, and thinks this could end badly as Kelvin casts an eighth nature magic spell called Angel's Tear. He summons a meteor from the heavens and the entire arena is stunned. 
Rick starts sweating bullets, realizing the champion is far stronger than anyone expected, and he mutters that at this rate, Ash might not be able to hold back. Ash quickly frees himself and counters the spell with sheer brute force, leaving both Kelvin and the crowd speechless. Seeing this, Ash decides it's time to go all out. Rick notices Ash giving a quarter thumbs up and puzzled, asks what it means. Rena explains that it's a pose orcs use when they have a dispute, signaling they will brawl it out without dodging or defending, so Rick realizes that Ash is about to go on full offensive. As Ash charges toward Kelvin, his aura radiates so powerfully that Kelvin feels fear for the first time in his life, and he is knocked back by the sheer wind pressure from Ash's punch. Angelica also is in shock, unable to believe what she's seeing, and she notices that Rick has already given up any hope, knowing all too well how this match will end. Ash then charges at Kelvin again, and Kelvin unleashes every seventh nature magic spell he knows, but Ash doesn't even blink. Rick observes that Kelvin is running out of mana, which makes sense given the sheer number of powerful spells he has cast. Then Ash lands a punch on Kelvin, knocking him backward. Angelica thinks it was a direct hit, but Rick calmly informs her that it wasn't. Kelvin used flowing impact, blink step, and defensive magic to soften the blow. Kelvin struggles to stand, feeling the last attack rattle his bones and organs. He thinks to himself that anyone else would be dead from that blow, and while giving up now would be the easier choice, he refuses to do it. He's waited his whole life to fight someone this strong, and he won't back down, so he forces himself up and throws a flurry of punches at Ash. But his stamina soon runs out, and he collapses again. In disbelief at Ash's strength, Kelvin hears the crowd cheering him on, urging him not to lose and to keep fighting. Kelvin is stunned that the audience is still rooting for him, even after he deceived them. Moved by their support, he decides he has to try and land another punch for their sake. He slowly rises again, and his entire body ignites in flames. Rick explains to the others that Kelvin just used Blink Step Enhanced with Stalwart Fist, and has combined it with Flame Sword for his roll fawn attack. Kelvin then charges at Ash with this fiery attack, and Ash takes it head on, but it barely phases him. Ash then asks if Kelvin has truly unleashed everything he has, but Kelvin, noticing that his attack only managed to push Ash back by a few inches, replies that he's given it his all, and he admits that this has been the most fun he's ever had in his life. Ash, respecting Kelvin's spirit, decides to end the match with a punch to Kelvin's face. As Kelvin falls, his master thinks to himself that the road to becoming the strongest is still long, but there's no doubt that Kelvin is the best fighter in history. That's it for this video, guys. If you like this new series, leave a like for the next episode. And subscribe for more Anon content. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.